Um, before I start, I just want to give you a little bit of my background. I was a classroom teacher for 35 years. I taught secondary science biology, anatomy, and microbiology. And I also was a science department chair for 27 years. So a lot of my examples today are going to be in science. <laughs> so I just want to prepare everyone for that. I apologize if um, that annoys you because it's not science. I also was, uh, I understand where you guys are coming from, I guess is where I want to start today because not only did I teach five classes, I did your book this time for science department chair. I also was National Honor Society advisor. I was the worldwide youth and science and engineering coach for our school. I also was a graduation coordinator and the senior class advisor. So I understand how much work and effort and time and sweat and tears go into this job of teaching. So um, I want you to realize that today I'm here to explain it to the ADU so that you can get a good idea of what it is and how it can help not only our candidates, but the students in the classroom. And if you have any reservations about NTPA or if you have any questions about NTPA, please feel free to ask, okay? So we're going to start the program here today by just talking a little bit before you go into the slides about the fact that now NTPA is mandated by the state of Illinois as uh, the final assessment for student teachers in order to get their teaching license. So starting September 1st, all teacher candidates have to complete this during their student teacher semester. Okay? We will talk about the scores, et cetera, what Illinois requires, et cetera, when we get into the scoring part of the presentation. But it is high stakes starting in the fall for all teacher candidates. So as a cooperating teacher, you guys have a tremendous responsibility you know, they say that the FTPA isn't any more work for the cooperating teacher. It's really not, because what this is asking the candidates to do, as you will see, is just be good teachers, and that's what you're helping them to do anyway. But there are some nuances to this FTPA, and it would be extremely helpful if you guys understood what the candidate had to do and what the expectations were. So we're going to go through that today. This is the cooperating teacher role in NTPA. And I don't know why this happens, but when I talk to teachers, I get really nervous. And I, so I'm going to have to stop and take a drink of water here. And I think that, actually, I think I know why it happens. You know, here I am standing up here telling you guys about what, te what these teacher candidates should know and be able to do. You already know it, right? You're teachers. You already know what the expectations are in the classroom. So I, I get a little bit nervous that you may think that I'm telling you what to do when in actuality I'm not. I'm just trying to explain it to you. So here we go. First and foremost, thank you. Okay? Taking on the role of being a cooperating teacher and inviting a student teacher candidate into your classroom is a tremendous responsibility um, to the teacher candidate and to your students in the classroom. I know. For me, it was so hard because I loved, loved, loved every one of my students and I felt a tremendous responsibility for them and I wanted to do everything in my power to make sure that they were successful and it was the only freshman biology year they were ever going to get. And so bringing a teacher candidate in who didn't necessarily have the knowledge and the expertise to do everything that I wanted was really, you know, extremely nerve-wracking and it made me very apprehensive. So right out front, I'm going to tell you that this NTPA actually is a very good thing because what it's making higher ed programs do is look very critically at how they're preparing teacher candidates to go into the field and making sure that all the pieces of the puzzle are in place before you even get them. So it's making the teacher candidates better as they come into your classrooms from the, from the um, colleges and universities. So, and I think you'll see that as we go through when you look at these expectations. And it's the responsibility of the university to make sure these kids pass, right? They have to get their teaching license. And so that puts a tremendous amount of responsibility on them to make sure that everything is in the programs that needs to be there. So, 
So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the teacher candidate because I know that was a hard decision to make. Okay, what is NTPA? It's a measure to capture evidence of prospective teachers' abilities to support P-12 students in learning important content. Okay. It's intended to be predictive. Is this candidate going to be able to function as a teacher in the classroom? And formative. In the process of completing this NTPA, as they go through all of their teacher courses on campus, as they go through all of their clinical experiences with you in the classroom, um, both in all, in all the clinicals, 201, 301, 401, and then in student teaching, um, there, it's a formative process where they're getting better and better and better at accomplishing the tasks that are um, outlined in the NTPA. So it's also formative, as I mentioned, for institutions because we get the data back to see how the students are doing. Do they know what academic language is? Do they get high scores on providing supports for academic language? If not, then we need to put that in our curriculum. We need to do it better so our candidates actually go out understanding what that concept involves. Okay, this is the piece of the puzzle that a lot of people don't understand. While NTPA is the capstone piece, there are a lot of other things in the, that the candidate must um, show proficiency in before they get their teaching license. So for example, they have to take all the courses on campus, and the courses have particular assessments, like for example, in a methods class, maybe they have to do a unit plan, or in their um, special ed class, and their differentiation, when they're worried about differentiation, they have to do a project for that, and they have to pass that. The candidates have to get a C or better in all of the coursework, including content coursework, that's required, or they don't get their teaching license. So that's step one. Step two, observation, supervisory, evaluation, and feedback in clinical placements. So this is in 201, if you've ever had a 201 student, you as a cooperative teacher provide feedback and fill out evaluation forms on the candidates. If they don't pass 201, they don't get their teaching license. They can retake it and try again, but if they don't pass it, they don't get their license. Same thing with 201, 301, and especially in student teaching. You as a cooperating teacher will fill out midterm and final evaluations. If you don't feel the candidate is prepared to teach in the classroom, you will document that on those evaluations, and that teacher candidate will not teach in the state of Illinois until they repeat that they get positive evaluations. So there's, that's another step in their process. They also have to take the basic skills, and unless, of course, nowadays in Illinois, if you take the ACT test um, within 10 years of being admitted to an education program, they get a score of 22 or above, and the ACT, ACT includes the writing component, you can use that in lieu of basic skills. Okay. The other thing is they have to pass their subject matter test before they student teach. So they have to take that's a content test for their subject. If they don't pass that, they don't student teach. If they don't student teach, they don't get their license. So let's say that they were successful in the first three, now they come to the NTPA. This one happens during the student teacher um, student teaching semester. And they have to show that they can teach. Okay. So it is a performance assessment. It's not just a written test kind of assessment, but it's kind of like the NCLEX for nurses or the MCATs for, uh, or the final boards, I'm sorry, for um, doctors, lawyers, etc. It's showing, it's a professional assessment that shows that you're ready to be a teacher in the classroom. So we've got a lot of stakeholders here. So these are our NTPA stakeholders. It's the NIU teacher licensure programs. We've got a huge invest investment in this. University supervisors, because they're out there helping their teacher candidates to be successful along the path um, as well. Cooperating teachers, you guys play a hugely instrumental role in making sure these guys are ready to teach. I mean, I've always said that. 
the teacher candidates learn more in those experiences that they have in the actual classroom than they can in any um, staged kind of activities in their methods lessons, et cetera, because it's on, you know, it's on the job and they get to actually see what's happening. So operating teachers are extremely important. School districts, because they're supporting the candidates, obviously the teacher candidates themselves, they're probably the most important are the students in the class, excuse me, students in the classroom. Okay. Because if this assessment actually ups everyone's game, the students are going to benefit. So okay. The FTPA was built on this premise. Effective teachers, and you guys all know this, so this is where I said I get nervous because I'm telling you this and you already know all this. Engage students in active learning. You're going to find, as we read through these, a lot of the stuff you guys came up with when you just did your share outs are in here. Okay? Engage students in active learning. Create intellectually ambitious tasks. Use a variety of teaching strategies. Assess student learning continuously, not just at the end of a unit, but continuously throughout. Adapt teaching to student needs, huge. Create effective scaffolds and supports. Provide clear expectations, constant feedback, and opportunities for revising work. Develop and effectively manage a collaborative classroom in which all students have membership. So this is the premise for the FTPA. So I want you to look at that and think for a second. Is there anything there you disagree with? It's what good teaching is, right? This is shifting the definition of effective beginning teaching from successfully delivering curriculum, like standing up and just doing the lesson, to having a positive impact on student learning. How have I affected the student's learning? Okay. Also, shift the business of teacher preparation from license as an entitlement. You complete these courses, go through these clinicals, get your student teaching done, and here's your teaching license, to an obligation to demonstrate the proficiency of the curriculum intent. So in other words, I always wanted to teach. I did this program. I've got my license to see. I can teach. So I submit this portfolio, it shows you that I'm very proficient at what I'm you know, supposed to be doing. The FTPA asks student teacher candidates to think and write critically about their planning instruction using data from their video clips and assessments. Okay, so I'm going to pause here for a second. How many of you guys actually know the nuances of the FTPA, know what the expectations are? How many have had no experience with FTPA yet at all? Okay, so for people that first raise their hand, I'm going to apologize because you're going to listen to this again. I'm going to go through it fairly quickly so, um, because we're going to go through it a little bit more in detail later. So this is what I usually use when I'm explaining what the FTPA is and what it asks candidates to do. This is the cycle of learning, student learning. And you'll notice the first thing up there is planning. So it asks the candidates to plan to build content understandings. Okay, they have to be an expert in their content. They have to know their content. That's a big no-no. If they don't, they can get automatic ones by saying incorrect things about content. They have to support the learning needs of all their students. So that means students that are on IEPs of 504s, but it also means regular classroom students, struggling learners, slow readers, gifted students. They have to be able to support all of those students in the classroom. They have to use knowledge of their students. Okay, so they have to know their, what the students already know and are able to do, their prior knowledge. They have to know about their personal, cultural, and community assets. So what do students bring to the table that may um, tie into the lesson? because they want to make those connections to make that learning meaningful. And then they have to um, plan assessments to monitor student learning 
And those assessments have to be throughout the lesson. So they plan a three to five day learning segment, keeping all of this in mind. And they have to assess every day of that segment to make sure students are meeting those learning objectives. It's not just a one and done at the end. It's they have to plan all, you know, informal, formal, formative, and summative assessments within that three to five day lesson. Okay, any questions about that? About the plan? I'm doing all the talking, I'm doing exactly what you're not supposed to do if you look at that one slide. Engage the students, you're not engaged. <laughs> any questions at all, planning? A lot of you are going to see this, that as a result of this planning piece, a lot of the disciplines have these really involved, crazy lesson plans. Oh my goodness. We had one student whose lesson plan was like 14 pages long for one day. <laughs> yeah. The reason we have those in place is because we put all of these pieces of the puzzle in that lesson plan. So we'll say, one of the first thing we have to have is the central focus of the lesson. A little bit different than purpose, we'll talk about that in a minute, but they have to have a central focus. And then we, they have to have the rationale and the scaffolding piece, because the lessons have to scaffold. They can't just teach the same thing for five days, just different ways, okay? The lessons have to build on one another, okay? But it also has prior knowledge. So the students have to go and find out, okay, what do the students already know regarding this topic? And then, when they're teaching the topic, they need to reach back and pull forward. So they already know this stuff, so I'm going to reach back and remind them of what they know or ask them to say what they know and then build on that. Because all of these lessons are supposed to be logical and progressive, right? And so they're asking, in one of the prompts, they ask it, um, to show how you illustrated or used prior knowledge of students. So they actually look back and pull that information forward in the lesson. So then we also include um, all of the objectives aligned with all of the standards because they have to be aligned. And so the objectives not only include objectives for the content, but in science, and you'll see each one of these has different um, specifications of what has to be covered within the NTPA. So for science, it's not only science content, but along with that content, students have to have, um, it has to have inquiry in there where students are using scientific inquiry and they have to use scientific practices correctly. And so that also has to be in there. So objectives for that need to be included and academic language objectives need to be included. I mean, it's huge. And the kids, you know, they go kicking and screaming, but I'll tell you when it's all done, that's one of the things we sat our students down and we asked them, you know, to explain some of the things that really helped you with this IDPA. And they said, you know, as much as we hated writing those lesson plans, they were a huge, huge help because it made them think through the process. They weren't just making it up after they were all done. It was already there. They could just pull that information out and put it into the answers for when they had to write about why they planned, how they planned it, et cetera. And then at the end of the lesson, then we have them, they have to have a plan so that a substitute could do, could repeat it if they were out of class. So they have to be, they can't just be teachable to synthesis, do lab. Okay, it has to be for, you know, this section, I'm going to do this, I'm going to use this, I'm going to ask these questions. For this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to ask these questions, etc. So that when a sub comes in, they can actually look at the lesson plan and use it. Now, I know you're all thinking, in the real world, how many times do you have a substitute that's actually going to teach what's in the lesson plan? But that's not the point. The point is it needs to be laid out for them. It makes them think through the process, right? And then, um, at the end, they have to have their, we make them in a table, put their objectives 
and the assessment question that aligns with that objective for that day because they have to have assessment questions for every single lesson. So as a result, these lesson plans get huge. And then they can only submit to, for scoring, a four-page lesson. Okay. So then what they have to do before they submit is take out things like prior knowledge, requisite skills, that big table about the assessment stuff, and make it into just a regular lesson plan that's four pages long. But they use the big one then to answer the questions for the prompts about why they planned the way they did. Okay, now questions. Wow. I must be good. <laughs> they have to do all of these things, but in the process they're thinking about what's best for their kids and how they can connect lessons and you know how they're going to assess. So, so it is a good thing, but it takes a lot of time. It's so labor intensive it is. that it, it takes away from their real focus on um, trying to be really purposeful with what they do with the students. I, I just felt like it did take away. And, and you know, it puts so much of their focus on, their focus is on getting a job, you know, let's say right. it, it's like passing, getting the job, and then this on top of it, and all the components of the videotaping, <coughs> editing, and it's just so much at such a crucial time. I feel like it would be better if they could do the student teaching, take, do these things, and then have all this do after the fact. The only problem with that, um, and uh, I will go back and address it too. But the only problem with having to do earlier in the semester is some programs actually use the grades from this for their grades and they won't be able to graduate. And it takes, there's a three week turnaround time from when you submit your NTPA to when you get grades back. So what programs have been doing to try to alleviate that problem, it's just try, and I'll explain why it's only try, is they have been setting due dates, okay? And best case scenario, especially if you have a student teacher and with all the CLAS programs, there's a 401 semester where you actually have this person before they walk into your classroom, okay? That's when you should start having the conversations. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. That's when you should have to start having the conversations about, okay, let's look at next semester. What lessons do you think will be, you know, possibly be good for the FTPA? Start writing your lesson plans now. For that. I did do that. Yeah, so that their planning piece, this first piece, and this is the piece that's most labor intensive, is that planning piece. So that that's totally done before they even walk in. And here's what I would actually have to do rather than just have them plan one, have them plan for two or three. Because things happen. Oh, yeah, no, it did. Yeah. Um, we, I wasn't, when she took over, we were hoping to have her start the unit on functions, and we weren't done with um, angles and that. So she did, she did have to take over a force portion she wasn't ready for. Yep, that's totally what I would do. I would, you know, have conversations with them in the 401 semester. Look at what's going to be happening in the following semester. Look at some pop. Now, once you get through this and you understand what the NTPA is asking your candidates to do, you can help them up to the point when they start this NTPA. Which does mean you, you, if they're writing the lessons for the NTPAs they're going to submit, you can't help them write the lessons. 
but you can talk about what lessons would be good for them to possibly teach for this NTPA, and then have them start writing their lessons. I know I had some students who actually got their lesson plans done in December, and they start student, start student teaching in January, and so then they used them, and that took a total burden off of them. Um, because, it, you know, you're right, it takes a lot of time. They have to answer all these problems, and it's a lot of pressure. And, they, and now, with it being high stakes and for licensure, the pressure is even going to be more you know, so the more you can help them out in that prior, that semester prior to you, and have a conversation we're going to talk about today, the more it's going to help them, I think. Can, will we alleviate that problem? Totally, no. It's just the nature of the beast. It has to be done in student teaching. There is no excuses for some programs. They need them done for a certain time so they can get the scores back, so they can get the candidates a grade. And if they don't, they can't get their license, they can't graduate, they can't get a job, and they at least aren't out there in that first rush of, you know, trying to get a job, and so, so yeah, there's just certain things you can't change, which would be great, great, great. Yes? Do we have access to the rubrics for the mm -hmm. assessment on this? You will. I'm going to explain. Okay. Okay. Any other questions about the planning piece? Okay. Great. Thank you for asking the question. All right. So, so this is the planning piece. Then I'm going to pick. And here's what I'm going to have to do with this, you guys. They're supposed to pick a segment of the, of the lesson videotape. Um, in science, they have to have two 10-minute videos. And they're very specific in what the videos need to show. So in science, the first video has to show them collecting the data, you know, and making sure that they're using scientific practices correctly, asking, you know, those important questions, etc. And then the second piece has to show them actually um, analyzing or looking at the evidence from the data, sharing out their conclusions, justifying those conclusions with evidence from the data. So the, the students in the classrooms have to do that. So there's two very distinct pieces to the puzzle. The more they videotape, the better. Okay? So I would have them definitely videotape all days of the learning segment. And the reason for that is because if something happens, then um, they can fix it, right? Or they might have some video footage that would be still appropriate, maybe not as good as they had hoped, but still appropriate so they can still use it because otherwise they have to redo an entire learning segment and re-videotape it, et cetera. So, and the best case scenario for that would be have them videotape everything from day one of student teaching. Every time they're up in front of teaching lessons, because if something happens, and let's say they don't pass, they can resubmit, but it has to be all new material. It cannot be from the same learning segment. So if they don't have anything from their student teaching experience, what do they have to do? Redo student teaching, at least a part of it. So they have to be replaced, redo, resubmit. So the more they videotape, the better. And we'll talk a little bit more about the videotaping in, in a minute. They are supposed to have a learning environment where students are engaged. That's huge. It's not just all students sitting in rows doing worksheet, worksheets. If they are, they're going to get a pretty low score for that. Yes? How does this videotaping impact FERPA? They actually, students have to have all of their students in their classroom, their parents, sign the video release forms, okay? And so in that video release form, it says right in there that this videotape will be submitted to a third party peers to publish in four scoring because of this NTPA. It also says at NIU that their materials that the candidate submits may be used to train future teacher candidates because we need exemplars for our students. We don't have any, there isn't any online. So that parents sign off on that. If the candidate allows us to use their stuff, candidates have to sign off on that. So we've got all of those bases covered with all the permissions. I, I, my concern is that, you know, I tried to do this just for one class of students this year, just for some pictures for Golden Apple. And it, to get those returns from parents are, are very difficult. So, I mean, if I have a student teacher, that's 145, 100 students, and that would be an awful lot of phone calls home, or, you know, letters and that kind of thing. Um, but, which we have to do, I mean, if we're trying to videotape, I mean, if we're going to do a lot, then I would, I would think that we would want to just 
focus on one class, that there would be videotaping taking place on classes. Especially if the candidate is teaching three of the same. Right. So let's say they're teaching three of the same biology classes. I would have them do video creations for all three, because then they could videotape in all three hours, and I would choose the best one for their assignment. Um, videotaping police forms, actually Chris Cook, our former state superintendent, sent a letter to all superintendents explaining the NTPA and asking, you know, telling them that this is what's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. Um, so school districts, for the most part, um, have bought into this. And some of them actually include that information on the permission form that they sent out at the beginning of the year to all the students, then they sign up for registration. We have a lot of parents that refuse to sign for us. If that's the case, then what happens is those students are not sent out of the classroom. They're still taught that same lesson, get that same learning experience. They're just off camera. So um, it, is, it is doable. I've had um, some of the students that have had only half of the class because half to turn them in. It's gotten better through the years, but Right. They're learning how to use, um, our yeah. district does have a form that they signed, but she said there was a specific form that was specific to NTPA that I think had to get submitted to Pearson. Yeah. And so um, we did limit it to one class of 30 students. So that it wasn't And she, she specifically chose the class that had um, the special ed, um, the IEPs, where her data would fit what she needed to do. So it, it was very conscious. And yeah, we didn't get all of them back. So, yeah. And it is allowable to blur faces. That's one of the things that they just started allowing. Um, they also don't want the school identified. So if you have on your wall the name of the school, they're supposed to blur that out as well. Now when the kids all wear the t-shirts that have the school's name on it, PP, then, you know, that's a problem. One class, they do three a three to five day learning segment for that one class, yeah. And so, but they can pick, they can take like three classes, and then after they're done, and they look at the video, they can say, "Ooh, I really like the second hour one better." It was the same material, it was the same lesson plans and stuff. So, then, but if it's different subjects, that will work. If it's different levels, it will work. If it's biology, advanced biology, you know, that won't work either because because it has to go with the plan that they created for the three to five day learning segment. Okay. So, you know, this is one of the things I was going to go over in a little bit, you guys, but um, helping students get those permission forms back is huge. So that becomes one of your roles as a cooperating teacher. I, you know, I can't, there are so many ways that cooperating teachers have done this. You know, some of them give, a, I'm not a proponent of extra credit, but that's what they give the extra credit, they give candy, they, whatever it takes to get those permission slips back. Um, maybe you don't have to do that to coerce your students, I don't know. Uh, in a perfect world, they just all bring them back. So, but they have to have them signed. Okay, any other questions about permission slips? Okay. So going back to learning environment, engaged students, they have to be, you know, the perfect scenario is students guiding their own learning. You want candidates to get high schoolers, that's huge. You know, if, the if it's a teacher-led classroom, they can still be proficient. But if it's a, students are engaged and they're learning, they're doing research, they're sharing with one another, they're excited about what's going on, that kind of thing, then the scores go higher. So they have to show the students are engaged in learning. They're asking those questions to get the students thinking deeply about what they're learning, or students are asking other questions, or other students those questions. And it ha they have to know their subject. This is one of the areas, one of the rubrics where they don't know their content automatic one. So assessment, this one's huge too. Um, for the assessment piece, students actually have to assess their students every day, but for this piece, they pick one of the assessments from the five-day learning segment, just one. But that assessment has to allow them to collect both qualitative and quantitative data. 
for every student in the class. Okay? So that they can look at whether or not students are actually meeting the learning objectives for that lesson. Right? You guys do that all the time. So the more you can help your candidates understand that process, the better. Okay? And then they have to provide feedback on that assessment to their students. It has to be both what their students are doing well feedback, equal amount of what they need to improve upon. It's got to be too acid. It can't just be all what they need to improve upon. They have to give, in that three to five day learning segment, they have to give their students an opportunity to use that feedback. This is across the nation. It's rubric 13. And it's the one place where most candidates score the lowest. And it's because they're good at giving feedback, but then they don't do anything with it. So it means, what are they, how are the students going to use that feedback? What assignment? What are you going to have them do next? You know, how are they going to show that they used your feedback to advance their learning? And then they have to reflect. Do this whole thing, they have to analyze. They have to explain why they chose the plans they did. They have to watch the video and reflect on their teaching. They have to look at the assessment data and reflect on their teaching and learning what was going on in the classroom. So they have to be a reflective practitioner. And then the academic language piece flows throughout. So, so that's the ITPA in a nutshell. Big process. For each one of these tasks, they answer prompts, and they ask them to explain. Explain why. Why did you select these learning tasks? What material supports did you have that kind of stuff? So, okay? There are subjects specific, as I mentioned, in science. Um, how do plans support development of students' abilities to use science concepts and scientific inquiry skills to explain a real-world phenomenon? So that's the science stuff. Okay. These are the key content that your understandings in your discipline. The first one, don't worry about elementary literacy, that is on there. It's got secondary English, secondary science, secondary history, and secondary mathematics. Those are the targets for the NTPAs in your discipline. I'm let you read those. or your program will give you access to your discipline's handbook and the templates the students have to answer. All of which include, the handbook includes the rubrics that you were asking about. Um, and there's some other documents as well. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. Any questions about this? These are all the areas of licensure in Illinois and they're all, they, every program has a handbook. Okay, your role, where to begin. I mean, we've touched on a lot of this stuff. So, read the ITPA handbook and templates to familiarize yourself with expectations. So we said, oh, this isn't any more work for you guys. <laughs> In a perfect world, right? But if you really want to help your teacher candidates, you really need to, to become familiar with what this is asking them to do. So, it's really not that big a deal. You read through them and you're going to go through them and you're going to go, oh my goodness, I don't, wow. So then I suggest after you read through them, which won't take that long, look at the understanding rubric progressions documents for clarity. Okay, so for that one, it'll tell you, okay, this is what they need for rubric one. So rubric one, they need to plan scaffolded lessons, et cetera, et cetera. So then the rubric progressions document will say, what do they need to do to be proficient? What do they need to do to get a three? And it clearly explains what the expectation is for the three. Our target is a three. They can have a score of one to five. Three is proficient, okay? 
So if you look at that freeze, this is what potential candidates have to know and be able to do, then you'll have a good idea. And then they're also, all of them are asked to read the Making the Choices document, and this is leading up to their planning. So if you read that ahead of time too, again, it won't take you too long. Okay, but here's the biggest point, and it should have been first. Stay the course. Okay, it says have discussions with teacher candidates regarding planning, instruction, assessment, academic language, and reflection. Who doesn't do that now? This is what you do as a cooperating teacher. You sit down and talk to your candidates about the planning, right? You talk to them about how they will instruct. You talk to them about the way, the best ways to assess student learning. That's what cooperating teachers do. That's why candidates walk out of your programs so knowledgeable and ready to teach. So really, it's not, it's asking you to do what you've always done. The one thing here that may be a little confusing or maybe unfamiliar is the academic language piece. But I guarantee every one of you in here has been using academic language in your classrooms all along. You just haven't really defined it as such. So for example, in science, academic language is science speak. It's how scientists use the language to convey ideas. So it's not only they Students will pick a language function, like justify with evidence. Okay, how does a scientist do that? And based on the content, what vocabulary will they need to do that? What syntax, how, you know, for example, if they form a hypothesis, you want that in an if-then statement. Scientists use graphs and charts, and they have to make them the correct way, otherwise the graphs and charts don't make any sense. So that's proper syntax. And then they'll stand up and use that data and explain what happened um, and how they drew their conclusions looking at the data. So that's a scientist, it's how they speak. That's academic language. And it's different for every discipline because every discipline has a different type of academic obviously language that you speak. So. So basically, the reflection piece, this is when you sit down with your cooperating teacher at the end of the day and say, okay, what went well, what didn't go well? And I'm sure a lot of you can attest to the fact that the candidate's gonna say, oh, I thought I did a really nice job today. <laughs> but actually, you were thinking, oh, well, maybe you could have done this differently or that differently. Getting the candidates to be really good reflective practitioners means getting them to focus on learning that's taking place in the classroom. I had one student that was going on and on about how, what a great job he did, and I pulled up the video and I said, look at this class. You see the three people in the middle? What are they doing? They were all like nodding off. It's like, okay, well maybe you need to change some strategies there. <laughs> because you need to look at what is happening in the classroom. Look at the assessments. Look at the videos that you're, that you're doing, or talk to your cooperating teacher and figure out, okay, Today you went pretty well, but how can I do it better? How can I reach more students? You guys do that all the time anyway. That's what part of what teachers do. So, oh, whoops. And share your cue, share your experiences. I mean, that one, they learned so much from you sharing your experiences, so. Okay, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna look at these tasks one by one. How much time? Where am I at? Okay. Oh, wow. I thought it was really great. Okay. Um, we're going to go through these. We're going to let you talk as groups, since you guys are already in groups. And we're going to talk about, okay, they have to develop three to five lessons built around a central focus. I don't think we need to really take a lot of time with that, because that's something that the candidates have been doing forever, right? They've been playing lessons. They may not have been scaffolded so well but they've been planning lessons forever. But what we are going to focus on is plan instructions with prior learning in mind. Okay, especially for programs. Well, actually, this is for everybody. How does the teacher candidate, because they're not in your school, they haven't been there, they don't know what other teachers are teaching, they don't know what, other, what the students have already learned. So the first thing I want you to discuss is how will you help the candidate discover what the students in their classrooms already know and are able to do. 
Okay. How can you as a cooperative te teacher assist them in that endeavor? Is there a question? Or does anyone not understand what I'm asking? <laughs> 